In part three, uh, we will tackle mathematics and physics from an epistemological uh, point of view. So, what's what's the how can because most of our viewers can say, yeah, mathematics is mathematics, physics is physics. So, what what are, how can we relate epistemology with these domains? Yeah, go ahead, Doctor Mas. Yeah, so actually, uh, epistemology is a is a is a form of meta tool with which you can see the overview of what you are doing, which is always good. You should never go and do things without having an overview of what you are doing. Actually, so in math, we have always a, 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 a certain phenomenon, and most of the mathematicians, as I said. Uh, consider math to be a reflection of a uh, uh, reality which is existing. And this was at least until the uh, 20th century, until the, the uh, mid of the 20th century, many, many people really thought that math is reflecting the phenomena which are really existing uh, in the reality. And this type of philosophy in, in itself uh, uh, where the phenomen, phenomen uh, is a math or logical truth, and this truth exists independent of the mind. This is called the correspondence theory of truth. Of course, we are going to discuss that this is not uh, accepted by many uh, uh, scientists today. We know now because of the uh, limits of our uh, formal systems that this cannot be uh, valid. So you have, you had at least originally math where you have a phenomenon, and then you reduce this phenomenon uh, into uh, to to into your uh, consciousness, and in your consciousness, uh, you have a logical argumentation, as you see here, deductive arguments. You could also have here inductive arguments. Uh, you have a certain language. You have certain terminology of the language. You have certain axioms which uh, provide the, uh, the basic assumptions about uh, your uh, phenomenon. Of course, all this is reduced. It's not, uh, uh, it's, it's not the, the full phenomenon, but only a reduction of it. Uh, so, in the same time, I am reducing, but also believing that whatever I reduce really exists in, in, in reality. So you have sentences in L, which are theorems, you have axioms, you have deductive arguments. And um, in the beginning of uh, the last century, this was all, all done using uh, the so-called first order logics, which is the first uh, uh, step, in, which was the first step in mathematical logics. It's the first step of formalization, uh, uh, which was invented actually by Frege, and then developed further by uh, many researchers, including Russell and the Vienna Circle and all this. Now, there is a question here. Uh, what are the meanings of the language which I choose? So I have, a, I have a sentences in a certain language. I do arguments. The question of the semantics, which we already discussed before, we, we said that uh, this interplay between language and its semantic is very important. So the meanings of L, if L is a first order language, you find in second order logics. So you have actually a hierarchy of logics, one after the other, one is, is providing the meaning of the uh, lesser. So second order logics, in second order logics, uh, sentences in second order logics are actually the meanings in first order logics, and so on. Um, this structure of mathematical logics is the, the structure we know today uh, to be uh, uh, relevant for many uh, areas of research. I have first order logics, I have second order logics, 
second order logics provide the semantics for first order logics. I may have third order logics and so on. Now, what makes a language first order? What makes second order? This is a, a technical uh, a discussion, which I don't want to go uh, into, of course, because it's a little it's very complicated. complicated enough. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so with, yeah, I so, think this is this is, uh, has has to do with the programming and. Uh, no, it has not to do with programming. It has nothing to do with programming. Programming mm. is some something different. But mm. um, let's keep here in mind that uh, we we will have always a certain reductionism. Mm. Yeah, you have the phenomenon which you are talking about, but you reduce it. In spite mm. of that, you think whatever you reduced is really existing in reality. Mm. This is the way mathematicians uh, usually uh, view the world. Yeah. Now, uh, we have here, of course, a big question because um, while I can prove the axioms here, these are the axioms, the red, the red ellipses are the axioms. So the axioms of L, it's possible to prove the axioms of L sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's possible to prove the axioms of L within the L prime, within the bigger language. So it's possible to prove sometimes uh, axioms of first order logic in second order logic. But the question is, what about the axioms of second order logics? So you could uh, think that we, we have a third order logic which we, in which you can prove the axioms of second order and so on. So somewhere you have to hypothesize again. So some, somewhere, uh, this proof uh, uh, structure has to stop. You need to somewhere to start from something where you cannot prove. So this is what makes uh, 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 the life of mathematicians actually not very easy because, because they know somewhere, even if they make a, a very a big hierarchy of languages, one after the other, somewhere they have to start with something which is not proven. Yeah, so they know this. But uh, they accept it, and most of our science lies actually in, in this realm, second or first, and first order logic more, because first order logic with the first order logic is, is, uh, uh, is more uh, uh, easier to compute. It's easier to compute. I'm not saying that it is always uh, computable, but it's easier to compute than second order logics. So this is the view in math. Let's see the view in physics. Now, physics is more advanced epistemologically because it put a line between the phenomenon and whatever is we do. Uh, the tangible uh, about world. Yeah, the tangible the, things. Yeah. So, so here, this the phenomenon is a physical object. It exists independent or it might even not exist independent. Anyhow, it, uh, um, whether it exists or doesn't exist independent has nothing to do with what we do here. So it's actually, uh, so uh, this is usually called the ontological level. So the, on, the level of ontology, the existence of the things per se, has nothing to do with what we do in physics, actually. So we build consistent models only. Uh, and this is called coherence theory of truth, and you could also call it critical rationalism. Yeah, so you have a certain phenomenon. Uh, you, you reduce the phenomenon through experiments, of course, mm. because experiments will, will, will tackle some properties of the, not all properties, but some properties of the phenomenon. Mm. So uh, uh, what do we have in the conscious uh, part? We have again this, this picture where you, you get axioms. You have also axioms, of course. So you did a model for your uh, object or for, for the phenomenon. You have an axiom, but you have also, also here a very clear line. You know that this is not uh, uh, reflecting truth as it is, because for you, there is no truth as it is. Yeah. Mm. So physics does so, not. So may I ask? Accept, uh, physics does not accept the idea that there is uh, that that truth as it is can 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 be reached by our science. Physics refuses to say that whatever we find in physics is truth as it is. Yeah. 
So uh, 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 how did how does it work? Uh, the language is math, of course. It takes math as a language. Now we know from the last slide that math itself takes logics. If we take mm. uh, mathematical logics as a basis, so this means that in the indirectly, physics takes logics as a also as a basis. Mm. It, it takes math means that you describe your your models using usually equations. You mm. don't describe it describe it using Aristotelian or or, or mathematical logic assertions, but you, you you use math directly. You form theories. You have terminology. And uh, this is a formal system of modern physics. It is based upon math. It has some axioms. Now, the question is, from where did, do we get the axioms? Mm. Of course, all this is OS, uh, objective scientific evidence leading to empirical belief. Mm. So whatever in physics is a belief. Not it's knowledge, not, not... exact knowledge. Yeah, it is not, knowledge is exact something knowledge. exact. But what we have is belief. Why? Because the axioms, most of the axioms you are using uh, are actually uh, also so, so, uh, so we... uh, beliefs. They are beliefs. They are not, they are not knowledge. Uh, like what we, what we said about Newtonian first law, we can say the same about the uncertainty principle in, in uh, quantum physics and, and so on. Yeah? So uh, the axioms here maybe is different to whatever we saw uh, with mathematics, that our axioms here, they don't come uh, via proof. For example, mm -hmm. uncertainty principle, there is no need even to, to prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, you just, it's enough uh, that, that in your experiment, you don't falsify it. As we said, because we have experiments, so we don't fal if we don't falsify a certain thing, then it, then it, it becomes like a wall. Mm. I tried to falsify something for a long time. It became, and so I, I tell myself, uh, it is, I am incapable of falsification. Mm. So this is where the incapability principle comes. For example, they wanted for a long time uh, to know uh, uh, the the place uh, uh, the place and the energy of uh, an electron, for example, mm. of a certain of a certain particle, and they tried a lot. And they thought it is. This is about quantum precision. physics, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so somebody came and and they failed all the time. They failed. When, whenever they 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 found the electron in a place, they lost its energy. Mm -hmm. Whenever they got its energy, they lost its place. So mm -hmm. with time, Heisenberg, especially Heisenberg, came with his uh, uncertainty principle, which says that we are not capable of determining in the same time the the uh, place and the energy of the of the electron so, so the this is now an axiom this is now an axiom of modern physics so is uh, the capability coming from is our incapability per se yes incapability room. yeah uh, incapability is a very important heuristic principle in mm. physics it's heuristic when i say heuristic means practical it's a practical mm. principle Mm. Uh, we discussed before how I get the physical law. Actually, I, I do this also with normal physical laws. Mm. Like I, I, I have an, a certain informed guess, and this informed guess comes out of uh, my experiments. And if I find something which I cannot falsify, there are many things which I, cannot, I was not able to falsify, I was not able to achieve. Then I I put this as an uh, as a, a wall or as a principle, like uncertainty, uh, which we have discussed now. Uh, now, if we look at formal systems of mass physics and language, here for the first time I put also language. We'll see why. Mm. So uh, the syntax are the formats of first order mathematical logics. Means you have only very so few. Dr. Functions. Nasser, you 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 captivated language with natural science, huh? No, we'll see. We'll see what. <laughs> no, this has nothing to do. Most with, of uh, the people say uh, language is is a domain of uh of of of, of your we'll, we'll come to this. We'll come yeah, to this yeah, we'll, yeah. in this slide. I I'll come to this in this slide. So well, in math, you have you have the syntax. You have formulas of first order mathematical logics. 
you use actually very few functions, only uh, zero and the successor function. You have uh, for the semantics first order models. I will not go in detail to explain what, what this is, of course. You have axioms, like for example, for the arithmetics we do in school, we have so-called piano axioms. For set theory, we have uh, the remainder of uh, Frenkel uh, uh, axioms. Um, the, uh, axioms are actually a set of rules which you apply on numbers to get uh, uh, other numbers and so on. Now, <clears throat> uh, we use sound deduction rules. We use also refutation. Refutation means that I start with the, uh, assuming something is false, and then I find a contradiction, or with assuming, uh, sorry, assuming something is true, and then yeah, find a contradiction, which means that I, I refuted my, uh, my original assumption. Uh, so you use uh, theorems using, uh, you prove the theorems using inference rules. You hypothesize uh, without evidence. As we said, in math, we don't have an experimental body mm. of data. It's so a formal do, system. Yeah, so what we do is that we assume some hypothesis. If I don't have a proof for something, then I assume whether uh, negative or positive that this is uh, the thing which is uh, happening. Now in physics, <coughs> uh, the syntax is our formulas of mathematics, calculus, differential equations, geometric spaces, probability theory, and all this. Mm. The semantics are the empirical models of physical phenomena. So we do for the electron a certain empirical model uh, constituting of formulas of math, and we know uh, we give for each um, uh, uh, notion we use in our uh, uh, formulas a certain semantic. Uh, our axioms and principles are empirically non-falsified. Mm. So for, like for example, Newton's first law. So our axioms need to be non-falsified. Of course, I'm not going to build physics on a, a principle uh, uh, where I can do uh, an experiment uh, mm. which falsifies it. It's, mm. uh, the principle should be uh, not falsified. Mm. Uh, inference rules are math operations, and the theorems you use also, uh, you, you prove the theorems like you do in math uh, using uh, the, the mathematical operations. Mm. Now, the hypothesis on which physics is built are assumptions non-falsified using experiments, and they can be also you, uh, uh, using the incapability principle. Now, I go now to natural language, and this is coming to your question. For a long time, until before Chomsky, uh, natural language was considered to be non-formalizable. Yeah? Of course, I'm speaking from the point of view Western science. So Western science actually looked upon uh, 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 natural uh, language and uh, disregarded it. Yeah? It was not like, for example, if you take uh, the point of view of Frege and Russell and, and Tarski even, they were really very uh, unhappy with, no. with, with natural language. Mm. And they considered it to be humanities between quotes yeah yeah uh, and it's not accurate uh, enough and, and not and not formalizable yeah, yeah. Mm. until until uh, the the beginning uh, of the 50s i think maybe the end of the 40s and then until chomsky actually when chomsky came he could show very clearly that even the syntax of natural language follows formal rules yeah and this is very very important uh, uh, discovery, because this discovery, this is a breakthrough which is the basis for all modern programming languages. Mm, mm. So actually, if you think, why, why are we now using uh, English for programming? Yeah? Mm. Uh, in the beginning, there were only zeros and ones. Yeah? Mm. So what, what makes you use English to program any machine? Exactly this discovery that some, at least some aspects of natural language are formalizable. Mm. And this is the, the, the great uh, Chomsky, actually. Chomsky is really one of the most important. He's the father uh, of the modern linguistics. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, so so he is in the same time father of the modern linguistic and of modern programming languages, if you think about mm -hmm. it like this, because, mm -hmm. because he he discovered some formal properties which are very vital, like regularity, context free, context sensitive, and context sensitive. We will zero in on this topic in the case of Arabic language later. Yeah, we will come to this. We'll come to this, but in any anyhow. anyhow so uh, until Chomsky, when Chomsky showed them that syntax is actually formalizable, uh, there was a big boom actually. It was like uh, a revolution started and it is still going on until now. Of course, there was a big quarrel. What semantics is, uh, lays, uh, behind, lies behind the syntax of natural language? So Chomsky himself refused, as he told me, because I contacted him to ask him about Arabic. Mm. Uh, he refused to give uh, uh, logical semantics to natural language sentences. Mm. And uh, my recent uh, publication was exactly about this. Mm. I can show that he's right, especially for Arabic. Arabic is contradicts uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, semantic models from logics. It means if you if you do for Arabic for the Arabic language, uh, semantic models in first order or second order, so on, you disturb uh, Arabic semantics, actually. Mm, mm. So here, so, uh, but most of them, I mean, Chomsky uh, is, is uh, one direction, but most of the current linguists, uh, especially computational linguists, mm. they consider semantics to come a little from uh, first order, from logics, and much more from what, what what we call lambda calculus, which is actually uh, more powerful than first order, but it is still a Turing machine, something like a Turing machine, which I will not go further in detail. Um, very important is now the discussion, what are the boundaries of the formal systems? For math, this was a, a very big surprise actually, Mm. Because they started with the idea, uh, all of them started with the idea, I can do everything with science. Yeah, I mm. can do everything with science. There is no limit. There is no upper boundary. And, and this, when this they... is uh, the, 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 main, the main idea of the Enlightenment, especially in the 19th century as well. Exactly, exactly. So they Most took this uh, idea. They were very euphoric and very... Uh, 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 happy, uh, uh, very happy to, to go into this uh, uh, endeavor. But by the uh, middle of last century, uh, here comes uh, the first imp very important boundary by Gödel, Kurt mm -hmm. Gödel, the so-called incompleteness theorem, where he showed that any formal system expressive enough to express arithmetics with piano axioms is either inconsistent or incomplete, mm. i.e. some theorems will always remain unproven. Mm. So he showed that even if you take the very uh, basic mathematics which children take in school, mm. when, when we say arithmetics and piano axioms, this is what we take in school, multiplication, mm. addition, and so on. Uh, using this very simple axiom of, of school, you can you can write some theorems which you cannot prove uh, at all. You are not mm -hmm. able to prove using mathematical logics. Mm -hmm. So he showed that this whole endeavor, this whole trial to 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 put mathematics on a complete and and solid foundation, so especially an, complete was an illusion <laughs> means, means yeah means complete means that any theorem you can prove using the axioms. Uh, this is not possible. Yeah? Uh, so Gödel came, it is the year 1935. In the same time, approximately, uh, Skolem. Skolem is a guy who is at least as important as Gödel, but many people don't know it, don't know him. Um, he showed that first order predicate logics cannot express some important mathematical concepts adequately. So even if I want to express some concepts like uh, express exactly. I, I mean, when I say express in this context, mathematics and mathematical logic, I mean to exactly characterize what I mean by finite, what I mean by infinity, and so on. 
He showed that first order logics cannot express those mathematical concepts adequately. Means as a tool for expressing infinity and finiteness, which are very important concepts in mathematics, of course. Uh, you cannot use mathematical logic. So this was another very big blow. Another blow uh, came, uh, I mean, all this shows that mathematical concepts are actually relative to an interpretation, not absolute, which is a very big uh, uh, blow to the idea that they represent some, uh, uh, some, some reality, yeah? Mm. So actually they don't, you cannot, uh, if, if you, uh, if you are still hanging around with the concept of absolute truth or uh, a reality which I can attain in some in somehow, then you you uh, you misunderstood uh, these uh, uh, boundary results. Mm. Uh, so mathematical concepts are relative to an interpretation, not absolute. Mm. The last but not least, algorithmic decidability. Many important math problems are proven to be undecidable. So for the mm. first time in history came someone who says that here is a very legitimate question of science, an open question, which we will never decide. Mm. Yani, take care of the difference between we can decide now and we can never decide. Mm. So uh, what, what these results mean uh, is that if we stick to, uh, to our fundamental mathematical logics as it is now, mm. as done by Frege and all the logicians and so on, we cannot decide some problems even if we take 1,000 years uh, in, in research. Mm. Mm. So this was new. This was very new epistemologically because mm. never before someone said, we have here a boundary of our own uh, uh, language or, or, or our own uh, 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 perception. Yeah, the first for the first time, someone came and said, uh, "Okay, it's uh, it's here is uh, if we continue with these axioms of mathematical logics, which are very important for rationality. Actually, many people consider mathematical logics a synonym for for, for uh, rationality." Mm. So this is the first time where we can show now that uh, we cannot decide algorithmically many, many problems. Now, what happened in physics is something similar. In the same time, approximately, they started to change uh, geometric spaces, dimensions, mm -hmm. and so on. And they found out when we change these things, scientific evidence changes. All of a sudden, the experiments give, give mm -hmm. me something else. Uh, oh my God, this means that experiments are also not g g giving the absolute truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I change some, uh, if I change only the ge geometric space, the way I measure things, and then mm -hmm. get something completely different, mm -hmm. then then uh, this means that I, I never really reflected reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which which actually they they by by that time they knew. The changing the perspective of measurement also changing uh, changes scientific evidence. Uh, physical truth is relative, not absolute. Mm. Now this is very important. Uncertainty is a principle, not a mistake. Now mm. uh, at that time, the people thought that uncertainty is is uh, only because we don't get uh, the right instruments and all this. But now there is a more general result. Uh, uh, Tarski is a guy who is a, a logician, mathematical logician, and he is the one who formulated the actual uh, formal system which we use today of mathematical logics. Mm. And he investigated formal systems which might not be uh, logical, because not all not all formal systems are logical systems, but all logical systems are formal systems. Yeah, so. Logi logical systems are part of the formal system. Formal system is something more general. So he studied formal systems in general, and he found out that any concept of truth is relative to a set of axioms, not absolute. Mm. So, so we know now that in the moment where we introduce formal systems, and this will be very helpful when we, when we investigate the Islamic background, because mm. We know now that any formal system 
cannot con contain a definition, a, a correct definition of truth within this formal system. Mm. You need to have something bigger to uh, de define the truth in inside the smaller one. Mm. So this is relative to a set of axioms, not absolute, and it cannot be defined within any formal system S, but in a meta level S prime, in which relations in S are objects in S prime. We can so we, we we can reach re, we we can know realities or some uh, relative truth, but we cannot know the truth in in absolute. There is no truth in absolute mm. Mm. For, for 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 our for our purposes. Mm. Of of course, in 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 our daily life, we know that there is some truth outside. Of course, mm. but uh, science is uh, science is is here saying that. It is not concerned with this ontological uh -huh. outside. Truth. It is concerned mm -hmm. only with our faculty of 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 uh, of knowing things and and believing mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So, if we only concentrate on our faculty of believing and knowing things, then uh, uh, then it is the the truth is only uh, relative to a set of axioms, and it cannot be defined within a formal system S, mm -hmm. but it needs a meta level. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Here, I, I would like to make a reference to fiqh and usul, mm. because also, why do we have usul of fiqh? Mm. Actually, usul fiqh is, is, is the first, the first, I, I, I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't think there is any meta science before mm. usul fiqh. Mm. Usul fiqh is this exact meta level. Mm. If, you, if you take mathematics out of mm. the phrase and put fiqh, you will find that this guy Tarski and is actually translated saying, fundamentals of jurisprudence. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so actually, Tarski has shown for any formal system that, and especially formal system of fiqh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, in the formal system of fiqh, you cannot define the truth. You need a meta level mm -hmm. uh, for fiqh to decide the truth, and this meta level is already there. It is usul al fiqh. So actually, mm. Tarski, Tarski mm. has reiterated for the formal system in a very, of, of course, in a very precise way, mm. what uh, Muslims knew uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, that uh, you need to have a meta level to define the truth before going into the science. Mm. So for any science, I need to define the truth within the science. I need a meta level to define it, mm. which is exactly what we have in fiqh. And this is a very good... Uh, link actually because mm. uh, it simplifies our idea uh, around a formal system of fiqh. Mm. Uh, how much time do we have now? I think we have two minutes. Yeah, only two minutes. I think we can uh, this part. Yeah, we, we can we can conclude. Yeah, let let us conclude this part mm. uh, because Brief, the, yeah. because, because it's, it's a, a, a copious uh, data, so it's. We cannot we cannot elaborate more because our audience can uh, understand it and take their time to fathom our yes, exactly. or yes, stomach. Exactly. So, stomach. Yeah, so, yeah. So we are we are we are still in the first part and uh, thank you very much. You are welcome, to, but but you can uh, so you, you 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 need to stop here and in in the fourth uh, part we can uh, elaborate uh, more. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anasser, for your precious time. And we will leave it here at the point that we uh, discussed the, um, the limitations of science. And we gave examples from math and physics and how science um, uh, is not an absolute thing, as some uh, ideologues or scientism <laughs> uh, claim that uh, our knowledge um, is uh, limited and um, uncertainty can be in the field of fiqh and we will discuss um, um, in details these issues uh, in the coming um, parts, uh, God willing. Um, it was an uh, amazing lecture and uh, uh, I can call it copious, <laughs> full of details. And God willing, we will um, we will do more videos. Uh, 
to talk yeah. uh, about your project, your main project. All these parts uh, are um, paving the road to the point. Uh, that yeah. As I, as, I said, as I said before, we are trying in this first part, this whole first part, we are trying to get some tools which yeah. make our life easier to understand uh, uh, what the formal project. system of fiqh are and our project also at the same time. Thank you okay. so much, sir, okay. and see you in the next uh, part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.